Hi, and welcome to Genre Chat. I'm Sherry Lynn Visbano. Today we have a wonderful author that some of you will recognize. We're going to discuss literary flair. This author has won many awards. He has his own podcast, but I'm going to let him tell you about that. We have Aaron Gansky here, everybody. Aaron, welcome. Tell, tell us about yourself, about your writing career and what you want our viewers to know. Oh, thank you. Um, I've been uh, writing for a long time. I, I studied it in college. I got my master's degree in it. Um, and I've been writing ever since I was a kid, but uh, became more serious about it in college. So I've written several novels. Um, my first novel was called The Bargain. Then I wrote, uh, actually I wrote a couple books on how to write fiction. Uh, first in fiction, Write to Be Heard. Uh, and I've done several novels, novels, probably best known for my Hand of Adonai series, which is a mm -hmm. adult fantasy series uh, that's won uh, an award. And, uh, but I've done some literary stuff as well. Who is Harrison Sawyer uh, and The Bargain are two of those working on another one right now. So, um, those are those are my credentials. Oh, and I'm a podcast host. That's the other thing that I do. I, I do a podcast on how to write fiction, uh, and my manager would be very upset if I forgot to mention that today. <laughs> so, make sure I get that there. Well, I was going to ask you about that in our interview anyway. But you're also a creative writing teacher, right? You're in your classroom right now. I am in my classroom right now. High school teacher. I teach predominantly English, but I always have a section or two of uh, creative writing. Love doing that. I do teach. Uh, uh, at a lot of um, writers conferences as well, national writers conferences around, uh, I guess, national writers conferences around the nation makes is redundant, but it, it happens. So uh, it's a Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers Conference yes. there several times and Orange County Christian Writers Conference and uh, some others as well uh, around the LA area. So uh, I do that. It's, it's, uh, if there's one thing I love as much as writing, it's, it's teaching writing. And so uh, it's always been a passion of mine. It's one reason why I do the podcast, just to be able to continue to do that and to, to continue teaching and, and investing in the writing community, that, which is really important to me. That, and it's important to people like me, too, who are just learning writing. I've been in, only been in for three years. And when I listen to podcasts and go to and definitely go to conferences and you people like you pour into us and we're so grateful. And I wanted to ask you, as a teacher, like in your podcast and in your, when you teach creative writing in high school, what is the, what is the subject that most people have a problem with in writing fiction? I think in writing fiction, the thing that, the challenge most writers face is the idea of show don't tell, uh, which is providing imagery and detail and description and figurative language and, and making the writing um, impactful. Uh, they, especially young students uh, in high school, they're, they're used to writing essays um, in high school. So they just want to outline everything and they want to go point by point and it ends up becoming as if you're simply telling a friend a story rather than um, writing an experience. And that's what I really want my students to really understand about fiction is you're not telling a story, you're actually um, engaging the reader in an experience, you're providing an experience for them. They should never feel like they're reading a book. They should always feel like they're doing whatever it is that the, the protagonist is doing. That's, I think, the biggest thing. That I find that too in reading book proposals. I find the show don't tell. One great piece of information that I received from a fellow author was pretend you're in their shoes looking at a, through a camera. <laughs> we're at Sorry school. about that. Yeah, oh, we're at that, school. I, I tried to meet that's the fire alarm, time. you better go. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. The place is burning down. It's fine. <laughs> it's good. Let's finish this first. Flames yeah. in the background. <laughs> As the firemen carry you out. Wait, I just got one more thing to say I'm about the of you. <laughs> one more question. <laughs> that's too funny. Well, that's why our, pod, our, our, our vlogs are just fun. And we just, whatever happens, happens. We just, yeah. we go with the flow. Yeah. When did you start writing fiction? Was that in high school, when you were in high school? 
I've always done it. I, I still remember going down to Arizona on a family trip to visit some family friends. And uh, this was before iPods and, and all that kind of stuff. I know it shocks you that I'm that old, but uh, I do remember a day before portable electronic devices. And uh, uh, for me, entertainment was a stack of paper and a pen. Um, and even at six, seven years old, I, I've been writing as pretty much since I could read. Uh, as soon as I learned to read, I started writing. And uh, I didn't really take it very seriously. I did some stories here and there. Uh, but um, in high school, I was like, oh, it'll be cool to be a writer. That would be a lot of fun. But you can't make any money as a writer. So I got to do something else. And so I convinced myself to try other things. And uh, then in college, they made me pick a major. They said I couldn't go there if I didn't pick a major. Um, so I had to pick one. And I, I chose writing as my tract of study. And um, that's what I've been doing. So that's when I started taking it a little more seriously um, in, in context of looking for publication and, and finding agents and doing things of that nature. So really, it was, it was more the college age where I kind of started to take myself more seriously as a writer. Now, uh, do you do you think that writing has changed over the years, especially in fiction? And how, uh, and how, if it has, how do you think it's changed? I think styles have uh, varied greatly. Way back in the day, um, authors used to get paid by the word. So you'd get a, a lot of words. The so Tale of Two Cities or... <laughs> Absolutely. expectations or something like that. Yeah, that continued on for a long time. And so you'd get these really kind of, for lack of a better term, these very obese types of, of books. Not to say that they're bad by any stretch of the imagination, but when you're getting paid by the word, it's a little bit different than when you're, you know, you've got a contract that stipulates you can only have so many pages. And so publishing has changed in that regard. And it's, um, it's it's going to continue to shift and change and it's a, a constantly fluctuating uh, business in, in terms of uh, especially digital media, figuring out how to best monetize that to minimize the risk for the publisher. There's a lot of things that publishers are trying to do. They're still, I think, trying to find a good business model that works for them. So you have the rise of the indie publisher. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've heard that uh, I went to a writer's conference where we were supposed to be encouraged and I was just an attendee and, and uh, the keynote speaker was talking about how you have a better chance of winning the lottery than ever getting a book published and it just went on and on about how you'll never get anything published and I was this is supposed to be encouraging I, is he reading his are his notes upside down what is, what's happening here it was very strange um, and, and that was the case for a long time. Uh, but I don't think that is anymore. You don't have a few big publishers that are the gatekeepers. Now you have a, a lot of small time publishers that are able to publish what they want when they want. Um, and so I think that there's a publisher for every story and every book. It's just a matter of trying to find the right publisher and find the ones that are out there. So I think the biggest change is, is how, um, books are consumed, how publishers are, are getting work into the hands of readers and what mm -hmm. readers expect. Um, I think readers really do, whether they can explain it or not, I think we've moved from this kind of uh, inflated prose to wanting a more succinct, efficient style of communication. Yes. Uh, getting to the point and not beating around the bush, so to speak. And so that's one thing that I really try and emphasize in my writing is I try and be ruthless with it and cut as many words out as humanly possible. The fewer, the better. Uh, and that's just been my motto. And that's a good motto. That's how I personally like to read. I don't like all the descriptions of everything unless that description needs to be there for to move the story. Right. So do you write, is it middle grade or YA or both? My Hand of Adonai oh series is uh, YA. I haven't done middle grade. Um, I don't... Uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't. I just, I'm saying that the story hasn't come to me. The middle grade story hasn't come to me. I really respect those who can do middle grade because that's might be one of the toughest areas to write. Uh, but I, I, I do teach high school. And so YA comes a little more naturally from me. I've read a lot of YA books, especially growing up and now try and read YA to keep up with what my students are reading. Uh, but I, I originally began with, I guess, more adult fiction or, or whatever you would call that, old fogey fiction. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, writing for adults, The Bargain, Who is Harrison Sawyer, more traditional um, contemporary novels, uh, not necessarily YA. So I've done a little bit of both. Now, 
What is the biggest lesson you've learned writing fiction? I, I've, there's so many. I, again, I, I think to kind of echo the idea of being efficient in your communication, um, the best advice I got was from my first agent, Diana Flegel. Um, not yeah. sure if you, yeah, Love you know, Diana. Diana. She's, she's good people. And she sent me a, a message saying that my, my novel was too telling. And I took great offense to that because I've always prided myself on showing and not telling. And then she showed me passages where I was doing it. She gave me a list of words to look for. Um, so I've done some blog posts on them. I've talked about them before. They're called sneaky prose killers. That's what I call them. Uh, and it's a list I go through and I go through and I, I try and um, eliminate those words as often as I see them. And that's one thing that keeps my writing tight. And I think that's one reason why I was, I've been able to land so many books is because I constantly come back to that list. I add to that list uh, and um, find my own little neuroses where I keep adding particular things. Uh, I always say he nodded. All my characters start to look like bobblehead dolls after a while because everybody's just nodding. So <laughs> I've got to look for that now. Um, and, and so just really being ruthless with that. That's probably the best advice that I've gotten, but also the advice that I never wanted to take when I was a kid, which is to read and to do it a lot. Um, and, and it seems ridiculous. I don't know any other industry where people think that they cannot do you never see an athlete say, I'm never going to watch football, but I'm going to be a professional football player. Uh, I'm going to be a firefighter, but I'm never going to study fires. Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. I'm going to be a writer, but I'm never going to read. But well, it doesn't make sense either. But for some reason, we tend to think that's okay. A lot of people who want to write, oh, I don't like reading. It's boring, but I like writing. Well, if you don't like reading, then you're not going to write a very exciting book. Um, so the more you read, the better off you're going to be uh, as a writer. I got that same advice from Jerry B. Jenkins, Cecil Murphy, Liz Curtis Higgs, all the people who are bestsellers, they say the same thing, Aaron. So that's, it's yeah. so true. I like to listen to audio books too. Love it. I, I do too. Um, I big audible fan. Um, I had a long commute for a long time. I have a much shorter commute now, but loved it. And I think one thing that you get with audiobooks is the sound. And so I, I'm fancy myself a, an amateur poet. Um, I, I enjoy writing poetry, reading poetry. It's one thing that I don't think a lot of people do that they probably should, especially if you're writing fiction. It sounds counterintuitive. If you're writing fiction, but you, you should be writing or reading poetry, maybe even writing it a little bit, because in, in order to write poetry, you've got to be very strict and follow forms and ah. uh, structured and writing within it's like learning to color within the lines is, mm -hmm. is how I think of it. so poetry is very much coloring within the lines and then not don't do free verse write some sonnets write some villanelles write some sestinas figure out what they are do some haiku and send quains those are easy um <laughs> sonnets writing, yeah, I, yeah i've written sonnets that's yeah and they, and they haikus, I've never written, I never tried a haiku. Can haikus you explain what a sonnet and a haiku is for those who don't know? Oh man, a sonnet, sonnet is, uh, man, you're putting me on the spot here. 16 lines, depending on if you're doing it. I think both Shakespearean and Italian sonnets or Petrarchan mm -hmm. sonnets are 16 lines. The rhyme scheme changes from one to the other, but it, they're rhymed quatrains predominantly. And you either have a rhymed couplet at the end, or I, I think just uh, the last quatrain. Um, Iambic pentameter, so, uh, uh, sonnets are always done in iambic pentameter. So there's a very structured, you have to think not just about the word, but the syllables of the word, the pronunciations of the word, where you put the emphasis. Um, and yeah. that, I mean, when you start thinking about the parts of a word and mm -hmm. the way the word sounds, uh, you're doing some high level thinking and, and editing and really critiquing your own work. That's why I like audiobooks so much is because you can hear the language mm -hmm. and there's a, a particular rhythm to it. it's almost musical uh and so i that's one other thing that i kind of aspire for with my writing is to try and hit those moments where they're as steve allman says hit that lyrical register get that uh, musical style uh, that musical sound there and so that's one thing that i strive for as well so writing fiction, it, there's so much to it as far as um, if you're going to do it in three stages, the, 
the character or the arcs and all that stuff. But once you get all that down, how do you add a literary flair? What, what is a literary flair to you? And how would you add that to your writing? You know, like your first draft, your second draft, whatever. How would you do that? I, I really think that the literary flair as you're describing it, I, I would call it um, maybe just an attention to detail and imagery and figurative language. It's how you say something. It's not what you're saying, but it's how you're saying it. Uh, for me, literary flair means that there's a, a pretty profound emotional impact to the writing. There's going to be a visceral, tangible emotional response on the part of the reader. Um, in order to get that, I, I don't think that's something that you get on first drafts. Uh, anybody who thinks they're writing a literary book in their first draft, you're, you're probably not. It will be literary on your second or third or fourth draft, but the first draft is just to figure out the story. Like you say, you get the three acts if you're doing the three act structure, which is not a requirement, but it's nice. Um, same with the character arc. You get all that stuff down. Then you worry about the language. Then you worry about the prose. Then you worry about what word follows which word, what word to use in this particular case. Um, is this word, is word A going to sound better than word B? What is the metaphor I'm looking for here? Really, I think literary flair means you've got to have a much higher um, accountability to the reader. You can't give them stuff they've seen before. You can't give them the same um, kind of stock descriptions of characters, you know, mm -hmm. eyes blue as the sky or eyes as blue as the sea or she cried a river of tears. All these things that we've heard a million times. If that, that's all you're throwing in your story, you're not really offering the reader anything new. Those are great for first draft. Those are not okay for second draft. So really kind of going through and agonizing over each word, each description, each detail. Um, and, and finding new and unique ways, surprising ways to um, convey or to communicate a particular emotion to the reader so that it's, it's, you're not telling them to be sad, you're simply presenting the facts and that is, has a, a visceral emotional impact on the reader. If that Can you sense. give us an example? Um, instead of saying she was sad, how would you add, how would you write that with literary flair? So sadness is one of those interesting things. Uh, I believe it was um, Chekhov who said, if you want to depict sad and, sad and lonely people, you must be cold. Um, and, and what he means by that is you don't want an overabundance of detail when you're talking about sad people. You want to simply um, present the facts. You just give them a, a detail or two. Um, the best example I can think of this off the top of my head is Popular Mechanics by Raymond Carver. Uh, and if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. It's about a page and a half. And when you get to the end of the story, it feels as if he's, he's physically punched you. And there's not a lot of detail. As a matter of fact, there's a significant lack of detail in certain places. But the conflict is so high. Um, and the details that he does provide are so um, appropriate. Uh, that you know exactly what happens at the end of the story. And it's, it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. He does another one called Tell the Women We're Going. Uh, and just with very simple, very plain language, he describes a very horrific act. Um, and so I, I think of things like that. Um, Who is I that author that again? Raymond Carver. He's one of America's greatest short story writers. Um, was no longer with us. Raymond Carver. Yeah. Uh, Flannery O'Connor's Everything That Rises Must Converge. Uh, there's an old lady trying to figure out where she is in life, I guess, with the new South that's rising. And she's from the old South and she's very um, from that Southern culture. And yet times are changing around her. She ends up getting attacked by this large woman on this bus. And um, her she instead of crying she gets kind of she gets knocked on her hindquarters and then thrown off the bus and um rather than showing us how sad she is and her her tears falling like rain she's she kind of sits there for a minute while her son belittles her and this is told from the son's point of view kind of belittles her a little bit see i told you you should have known better and blah 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 and then she kind of gets up and starts walking off and doesn't say anything and that's when the the son starts to realize something's really wrong with her and so by not saying something's really wrong with her 
um, by simply right. showing her reaction to it. Um, that's that goes into the show. Don't tell, but it yeah, also resists the urge to explain. Yes, don't over show, um, mm -hmm. but also don't simply tell. And so there's there's a balancing act. Uh, I, I didn't come with examples ready, um, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, I there's a guy named Aaron Gansky and his book called the the bargain is phenomenal. It'll change your life. Um, so just, you know, maybe well, look can you it. give us the, can you give us his website? Yeah, it's uh, Aaron Gansky.com real tough to remember. So two A's <laughs> R O N G A N S E Y.com. I try to keep it simple. <laughs> I want to, you were, I want to back up a little bit. You were talking about the sneaky prose killers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that like fluff words, like about and up and down and, and words like that? Yeah, prepositions. Uh, looked is a big one. Um, or saw, for example. Um, he saw her, I don't know, he saw her crying. Uh, you can just simply say she cried. It's a much more efficient mm -hmm. way to do it, right? Um, he could see, could's another one, he could see um, her running down the street as opposed to she ran around down the street. He could hear the train whistle uh, in the distance. In the distance, a train whistle shrilled. Uh, and so you change things up by removing some of those words. Uh, like you say, they're fluff words. They don't really add anything. The just is one that I use. I just use it too much. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. And you can take that out 99% of the times. And I, mine is that. I use that quite often. So is this at your website? Do you, or you explain it on your podcast or both? Yeah, uh, I've done it on my podcast. I've done a blog post on it. Um, so the list has been published several times, not only on my site on, on it's been reposted uh, several times as well. So if you just do a, a search for sneaky prose killers, I'm probably going to be the first thing that pops up. Um, otherwise you can just do a search for sneaky prose killers, Gansky or Aaron Gansky, sneaky prose killers. That'll, that'll come up. I've done a few of them. So you might see a few hits return on that. Are there any books that you would recommend for liter writing literary flair? I think the first one that comes to mind, uh, is mystery and manners by, by Flannery O'Connor. Love Flannery O'Connor. She's one of my favorite um, authors of all mystery time. Mystery and manner. Yeah, mystery and manners. Uh, it's a collection of some of her speeches and lectures and letters and things of that nature um, that her, her friends had collected over the years before she passed about writing and how to write. Uh, and it's it's phenomenal. It's I don't know that it's necessarily for beginning writers. You know, you're not going to get the traditional approach about character and conflict and setting. And um, she, I think, deals more with the philosophy of writing. And she has some pretty profound, insightful things to say about fiction that I've never heard anybody else say. And it's really revolutionized how I write and how I think about writing, especially in context of how to end something. Um, I, I tend to find that my endings have gotten significantly stronger since I've studied mystery and manners and what she has to say about endings. Um, and so I, uh, at least the endings of my short stories, my novels, you know, it's a different story, but my short stories for sure. Um, and so I, I would really highly recommend mystery and manners by Flannery O'Connor. Now tell us a little bit about your two books on writing, your literary, your first in fiction and your right to be heard. Tell us what the context content is of each of these books and where we can get them. You can get them both on Amazon. That's the easiest way to get them. Um, and the first in fiction book was actually uh, some work. I don't want to call it my thesis, but it's what amounted to part of my thesis uh, while getting my master's. I had to write a critical paper. And so I, I did an analysis of the 100 best lines in fiction as voted on by the American Book Review. And so I, I took a look at the top 100 lines of novels and analyzed them, broke them down into categories. Here, this one is doing this. Here, this one is doing that. And so it's a, it's an, it was at first a very academic approach to it uh, because you know I was in a master's program, so I had to show off how smart I was. Uh, but <laughs> the, uh, the published version for the public, I've, I've adopted a much more informal tone. So it's playful, it's fun. 
Um, and it's, it's not, not a long book. Um, it's, it's pretty short. You can read it in an afternoon easily, but it's definitely one of those books that you, you want to keep on your shelf. Um, and you come back to it, you know, after you finish your novel and you want to find the best first line for it, then you pull that back out and you look at it again, or you're starting a short story, uh, you know, look at it again and, and, uh, gives some really good practical advice, uh, for how to write a good first line, but you can extrapolate that to how to write a good first page, how to write a good scene, how to write a good mm -hmm. chapter. You follow those uh, those tenants, the, if you will. Um, so that's where that one came from. The second one, Right to Be Heard, I was contacted by a friend of mine from that master's program. She knew I had written firsts in fiction, and she had this idea that she wanted to do a, a book about um, how to write fiction for a teenager, uh, geared oh. toward teenagers, so the high school student. And so we've done that. We, she said, will you help me write it? I said, sure. So we brainstormed some ideas, threw it back and forth. We wrote the thing fairly quickly. And so it's, that's a more systematic, holistic approach to writing fiction. It, there, it's going to say, here's how you develop your characters. Here's what you need to think about. And then here are some prompts here, you know, write uh, this type of a story, write that type of a story with this character, with that character. And so there are several pages in there that are just blank. So you can get the digital version, but it doesn't have the same kind of, um, if you're thinking of gifts coming up for, for Christmas, um, for the young writer in your life, uh, this is a great, great gift because it's got those blank pages in there where they can write directly in it and they can go back. I, if it's in pencil, they can erase it and try it again another time, or they can always just come back and see how far they've come as a writer. Uh, so there's lots of, of good, fun activities like that. Don't, don't you think that it would be beneficial to someone like me who is learning how to write fiction or somebody, even somebody who's been writing for a while just to go back and review? never hurts it never hurts and especially if you haven't tested the waters of fiction much if you're predominantly a non-fiction writer uh it's a it's a different animal it's a different beast and this will definitely kind of help you look at it um again holistically and kind of understand the the way fiction works and and how you piece things together um and so yeah it is very very beneficial for that it's geared toward high schoolers but it's not exclusive to high schoolers by any stretch of the imagination Wonderful. I think I'm going to go get it. <laughs> I want to back to your other book, uh, Firsts in Fiction. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend uh, everybody want you must have a good opening line for your novel? Absolutely. Must have. Sh it shouldn't every every chapter have a good opening line? Yeah, I, I, and a I, good I, ending line and a good hook. Yes, I've not done the endings just yet. I did, I've taught classes on endings, but I haven't put a book together on it just yet. Uh, but yes, it, it, you need to have a solid ending. It, I was in a band for a number of years and the two most important songs, your first song, your last song. Uh, comedians, <laughs> I'm studying comedians because I'm writing about a comedian. Your two strongest <laughs> jokes, gotta be your first joke, gotta be your last joke. They, that's what people are going to remember. Uh, yeah. I used to edit a, a literary magazine or a journal rather online and I could tell from the first line whether or not I was going to accept a piece and mm. and I was right about 90% of the time if I like that first line I'm probably taking this piece if I don't like the first line I'm probably not taking it um, you know there's some variation <laughs> there, but not a lot and so yeah you can use this for not just for the first line of your novel but also for the first line of your chapters yeah very uh, very sound advice it's gotten some very good feedback. Of course, you can read the reviews on Amazon if you don't believe me, but um, I've, I've had several people teach from it and assign it to their college students and things of that nature. So it's, it's got a fairly decent reputation. That's, I think Jerry Jenkins used your book in one of his classes. Don't, don't quote me on that, but he talked about, he talked about first lines and getting them from a book. So it might have okay. been yours. Who knows? I so. I, that's where the, I started looking up at first lines for my, the first line of my fiction book. Um, we have a few more minutes. I want you to, can you tell us just in literary prose, what would be your, best words of wisdom? Uh, um, I, I keep coming back to, to reading a lot and reading widely. Um, read things that you're not necessarily comfortable reading. Stretch your boundaries a little bit. Uh, at Antioch, it was a very liberal school, but it, the, their mantra was write what you're afraid of. Um, and the idea is if you can write what you're afraid of, it's gonna open you up to be more vulnerable in your writing. Um, 
more accessible, if you will. Mm. And, and it took me a while to do that, but I feel like I'm a better writer for having done it. The, the scene that I wrote will never see the light of day because I, it was, it was, I don't know, it's therapy, not therapy. It was, uh, it was grueling having to write that kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, it helps you to get to know who you are as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really stretches you. And so that's what I would say about a literary flair is, is never stop learning. Always challenge yourself. Uh, you don't get stronger by lifting light weights. So you read. <laughs> I like um, that. Yeah. I, um, that's, that's really profound. I mean, it is. Yeah. I, I mean, you're never going to get any better if you keep lifting five pound weights. So you're going to have to try 10 pounds. Read, read the masters, read mm -hmm. the classics, read the good ones. Um, read the contemporary masters uh, and, and challenge yourself in your writing to go outside of your comfort zone and do new things um, and see what you can accomplish. It's not always going to, you're not always going to hit a home run. Sometimes it's going to be terrible, but it's like writing poetry. You're, you may not write poetry for publication, but just writing poetry is going to be an exercise that you can do to continue to develop yourself as a writer listen to podcasts, um, get books on writing, read books on writing, uh, study uh, the best books that there are out there. Um, that's, I think, really what it boils down to is to be a student. Make yourself into a student uh, mm -hmm. forever. Never, never think that you know everything. That's great advice because I know some, every best-selling author that I've read about or talked to or interviewed, they say the same thing read, read, read. And all of them, some of them have got, I mean, I've talked about Jerry Jenkins. We know he's got so many best-selling books, but he's never stops learning. And that makes me feel good that someone like him never stops learning. Cecil Murphy, he never stops learning. Liz Curtis Higgs, she never stops learning. And people like you, I mean, I aspire to write as well as you. I mean, you never stop learning. So that's the thing. Always learn. I want to thank you, Aaron, so much. And I want to, please, how can people get a hold of you? Um, I want to tell us where we can get a hold of you for your uh, first in fiction podcast. And if someone wants to email you. So the, the easiest way to contact me at AaronGansky.com. That's my website. Uh, and, and you can email me from there. There's a contact form. It's where my podcast is. You just click on, I think it's under First in Fiction or blog or something like that. It's pretty easy to find. It's pretty easy to navigate. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's probably the easiest thing. I'm really responsive to email. That seems to be the way I, I communicate most efficiently. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty good about that. Would love to hear from you guys and from your listeners, uh, as well as social media, but I'm, I'm just going to be completely honest. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. And when I say I'm on it, I mean, my social media manager <laughs> is on it. And so if you contact me that way, it's a very good chance that she's going to respond to you, but she knows what I'm going to say more often than not. She's great. She's great. Yeah. And her name is Molly Joe Reilly, and, and yeah, she's, she's uh, awesome. She's she does a good podcast. job. Yeah, she's on. She manage, or manages our podcast or produces. There you go, produces our podcast and that kind of stuff. So, um, she's real good about contacting me if it's something. Anytime you guys have questions or something like that, don't be afraid to uh, shoot me an email. Um, so yeah, that's probably the easiest and best way. Now, real quick before we sign off, where are you going to be teaching next year? Because I know you probably have a few conferences that have already invited you back. I actually uh, don't. Uh, I'm not doing. Oh blue my! Blue. Well, if any conference people are watching, you better invite him. He's awesome. <laughs> I've, I've uh, I was on faculty at Blue Ridge for I think seven years in a row. And, oh, so they're giving you yeah. a break. <laughs> yeah, it's. It, I don't want to call it furlough or, or whatnot, but uh, <laughs> it's they. The, the Blue Ridge Conference is, is one of the best conferences I've been a part of. Um, mm. and so one of the ways that they keep it good is by trying to rotate the faculty. So they're always bringing in uh, new writers, different perspectives, things of that nature, so they don't become stagnant. It's not the same conference year in and year out. Every year is different. And so um, I knew I was probably overdue for a year off. Uh, I'm going to do my best to get out there and just attend and see all my friends. Um, I, I've had some other offer, offers and opportunities, but nothing is, has worked out with my schedule just yet. So, uh, my 2018 is, uh, I'll probably, it'll probably fill up closer to the summer 
uh, when we get in towards spring and doing some of the summer conferences and stuff like that. So Wonderful. Well, thank you, Aaron Gansky. Yeah, thank sure. you all for listening today. I'm Cherry Lynn Bisbano for Genre Chat, and tune in next time.